We're rolling. Daf Mem Aleph Amar Aleph. So we were learning yesterday that there's a debate as to whether or not when a fast day falls out on a Friday, whether a person is obligated to be mashlim the tainus, which means to fast the full day and go into Shabbos hungry, or whether there's a preference to break the fast early by eating something, a small amount, in order to not enter into Shabbos in a disrespectful fashion when you're ravenously hungry. That's the debate. Okay, so we're now on the sixth line on Daf Mem Aleph Amad Aleph. Tanya, Amar Rebbe Yehuda, Pa'am Echas Hayinu Yoshim Lefnei Rebbe Akiva, Betishvot Shechal Yos Be'er Shabbos Haya. One time we learned in the Bryce so that Rebbe Yehuda says we were sitting in front of Rebbe Akiva, and it, uh, Tisha B'Av that year had fallen out on a Friday, which doesn't happen in our calendar, but this was before the fixed calendar. Ve'hibiyulo Beitza Megulgeles, and they brought him out. It was right before Shabbos was about to start. They brought him out a soft roasted egg, and he swallowed it without salt, which means, I'm assuming that he wanted to demonstrate that he wasn't eating it because he wanted he was desirous of eating something tasty, but just wanted to get the nutritive value. And it wasn't because he desired to eat it, it wasn't because he, was, he needed to eat it, but he wanted to demonstrate to the Talmudim that the halacha is that you should not enter t- into Shabbos ravenously hungry and better break your fast before the tainus is over. The Rabbi Yossi Omer Misana Umashlim, and Rabbi Yossi disagrees with Rabbi Akiva, and he says that you have to fast the entire day, even when it's on a Friday. So Omer Lahen Rabbi Yossi, Ia Temodali Betisho Shechalios Be'echad B'Shabbos, Shemapsik Mi Ba'odyom, so here is Rabbi Yossi's argument. Let me prove to you, let me argue why I'm right that you should fast the whole day on a Friday. He says, look, when Tisha B'Av falls out on a Sunday, don't you agree that in order to properly start the tainus, you have to begin fasting <coughs> even before Shabbos is over in order for you to properly, you know, as you can't, you know, you can't give it, get it exactly right, so you have to start the tainus even before, uh, Tisha, even before Shabbos is over. So Amr Lo Avol, they said, yes, that's true. So the argument that he puts forward is like this. Look, if you have to end Shabbos in a state of hunger by refraining from eating a little bit at the end of Shabbos, what's wrong with refraining from eating a little bit when Shabbos enters and you'll just wait a few minutes to make Kiddush? Of course it's different. <laughs> so, so take a look at so take a look at the answer, Alan. So I'm Rulo, So they said back to him. So you're you're really questioning, like, what was Rabbi Yossi thinking, right? But this the answer seems to be so obvious. So this is exactly Alan's argument. Alan was machaving to the to the argument that the Chachamim said back then. They said, look, how can you compare, you know, uh, I know plenty of people who don't eat Shalashudas uh, Shabbos afternoon because they overate, they had that second or third bowl of Cholenta for lunch, so that's no big deal to not eat at the end of Shabbos, right? But, uh, but it's a big deal to go the whole day Friday and not eat. The, you, the, your state of hunger is quite acute when you enter into Shabbos. Okay, so that's the argument. Va'amar ula halacha karebiyosi. But despite that, Ula concludes that the halacha is like Rabbi Yossi. Frek the Gemara mi avdin and Yossi. Since when do we paskin like Rabbi Yossi in this regard? Or in Minhi, let me show you a brisa. Ein gozer in tainus alatzibur berashi chadash and bechanaka uvepurim. This is, has to do with the laws of tainus, which we learn in Maseches Tainus, that we don't initially decree a fast day to coincide with Chanaka, Purim, or Rosh Chodesh. However, the imischilu ein mafsik in divar Rabbi Gamliel. But, says Rabbi Gamliel, let's say <coughs> the Chachamim, there was a famine and they instituted a series of Ta'aniyas, let's say a series of Monday, Thursday, and Monday for a several consecutive weeks, right? And it just so happens that one of those Mondays or Thursdays coincides with uh, Chanukah, Purim, or Rosh Chodesh. So if they've already instituted it, then B'dyeved, we let people fast. And Amar Rabbi Meir, Afal Pish, Amar Gamliel, Ein Matsik, Ein Modaya, Shein Mashlimen. And Reb Meir clarifies, and he says that even though Rabbi Gamliel says we don't stop people from continuing their fasting pattern, but nevertheless, on those holy days, we don't let people finish the tainus. We tell them to break their fast a little bit before the end of the day. And the same thing is true 
that when Tisha B'Av falls out on Friday, we instruct people to break their tainus before Shabbos enters. So you see, this is not like Rabbi Yossi, right? So Vitanya la'achar petiraso shorab and gamliel nechnas Rabbi Yehoshua lahaferes devara. And the Brisa continues. The Brisa says that after Rabbi Gamliel passed away, Rabbi Yehoshua, as we know from many places in Shas, there was a certain tension in the relationship between Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yehoshua. Rabbi Yehoshua decided that he was going to change Rabbi Gamliel's decree. Rabbi Gamliel was the one who had said that you don't, you're not mashlim, you, you do break your fast. So Ahmed Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Yehoshua wanted to change it. He wanted to say that a person should be mashlim. So Ahmed Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri al Ragla, Omar that Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri stands up and he says, listen, I take note of the fact that we always go according to the Gedolim and to those people who came before us. That's how we're supposed to follow halacha. So the whole, during Rabbi Gamliel's whole lifetime, we made the halacha like him. You now, Yehoshua, you want to uproot the halacha. No, we've always been going like that was instructed to us by the Godel Hador. Yehoshua, in Shomim Lecha, Shekvar Nikva, Ahalacha Karam Gamliel. That we're not going to listen to you, Rabbi Yehoshua, because we've already established that the Halachas are like Rabbi Gamliel, that we do break our fast towards the end of the day. And no one protested to maintain the Halacha like Rabbi Gamliel. So how can you tell me the halachas like Rabbi Yossi when we see very clearly from these two brises that the halachas like Rabbi Gamliel that you're mapsik, that you have to you have to interrupt the fast and not be mashlim? So the Gemara answers: B'dorosh Rabbi Gamliel avet kar Gamliel, B'dorosh Rabbi Yossi avet kar Yossi. Answers the Gemara very simply that for the rest of the time of Rabbi Gamliel's generation, even after Rabbi Gamliel was nifter. But during the time that his colleagues were still alive and his, his contemporaries were still alive, they always maintained the halacha like Rabbi Gamliel. And that's what you see from that latter b'risa. But that doesn't address what they did in subsequent generations. Rabbi Yossi lives in a later generation, and therefore Rabbi Yossi feels justified to change the halacha and to be machmir and to say that even when it falls out on a Friday, you have to completely fast. Zafrek the Gemara uvedoro shabam gamliel avid karam gamliel. You mean to tell me that during a gamliel's generation, they always paskin like Rabbi Gamliel vis-a-vis the Tainus? The Hatanya Amar Rabbi Lazar b'Reb Tzadok ani me b'nei san av b'minyamin. Rabbi Lazar says, I am a descendant from this family of Binyamin called San Av. Now, what was special about this family is that, as discussed in Maseches Tainus, that there were different families who had different zechuyos in the temple. And one zechus in the temple was is that the, on the 10th of Av, the family of San of ben Binyamin was in charge of taking care of the Atse HaMa'aracha, of restocking the woodpile for, uh, for the firewood on the Mizbeach. And therefore, because they were in charge of that, it was a special yomta for them. It was a special celebratory day. They made a big, like a big festival out of it, the whole, the whole, the Gansa Mishpocha. So he said, I'm from that Mishpacha, and Pamechas Chal Tishabav Lihiyos B'Shabbos, and one year Tishabav fell out on a Shabbos, and therefore, Udechinu Hu La'acher HaShabbos, V'his Aninu Bo V'lo Yishal Menu Hu Mipnei Sheyom Tov Shalanu Haya. And so he says that because Tishabav that year fell out on the 10th of Av, which was the exact day of our festival, we fasted, but we didn't finish the fast. Why? Because it was a Yom Tov for us. So the Gemara makes a diok as follows. Time of the Yom Tov, Ha'erev Yom Tov Mashlimen. The whole reason why they didn't complete the fast was because it was Mamish, their festival. But if it would have been the Erev of their festival, the Eve of their festival, it sounds like they would have fasted the whole day, which sounds like that Rabbi Elazar Bereb Tzadok was paskaling like Rabbi Yossi and not like Rabbi Gamliel. And like Rashi points out, Rabbi Elazar Bereb Tzadok is the same as a contemporary of Rabbi Gamliel. So you see, even during Rabbi Gamliel's generation, they didn't paskan like Rabbi Gamliel. So the Gemara says, no. Amar Ravina, shiny yom tov shal divrei ha mitoch shem isanan bo shos, mashlimen bo arvios. Shabbos, hol vein misanan bo shos, in mashlimen bo arvios. Answers the Gemara, no, you're comparing apples and oranges. When it comes to a, a festival that a certain family, like a rabbinic festival that just, and especially this kind, that just one family celebrates, 
So that's something, that's a day where you can even justify fasting on that day, at least a portion of the day. And therefore, the eve of that day, we can also justify fasting the entire day. <coughs> but on Shabbos, Shabbos is a day where you're not even allowed to fast the part of the day. So that's the reason why even Rabbi Lezab Rabbi would agree that on Erev Shabbos, you cannot fast the whole day. Granted, on his 10th of Av personal holiday, he would agree that you could fast the whole day on Tisha B'Av, right? But that's because it's a personal rabbinic holiday. Right? But in the case where it's, if it would be Arab Shabbos, he would agree to Rabbi Gamliel that you can't fast the whole day and enter into Shabbos in a disrespectful hunger. Amar of Yosef, lo li hashmaita. So Rabbi Yosef says, you know what, I never heard the psak from Ula that the halacha is like Rabbi Yosef, that you fast the whole day, even on Arab Shabbos. So Amar le Abaye, atamart ni halan. So Abaye says, au contraire, you actually taught this halacha to us. And like Rashi points out, as he does in several places in Shas, the Rabbi Yosef, as an older man, had some kind of Alzheimer's or memory loss, and he wasn't able to remember everything that he had taught his Talmudim. So Rabbi had to remind him, you actually gave us this year already, and on that you taught us, you had taught us as follows. Remember that Brisa <coughs> that we just saw before, that was quoted the name of Rabbi Gamliel, that we, that we don't Initially, lechatchila, we don't decree fasts to coincide with Hanukkah, Purim, and Rosh Chodesh. But if they do coincide, then b'diyevet, we let people fast. And it was said in the name of Rabbi Gamliel, <coughs> but we don't complete the fast on those days, nor on when uh, Arab Sh- when Yom Kippur falls out, uh, when rather Tisha B'av falls out on Erev Shabbos. The Amrin and Allah, Amar Rav Yehuda, Amar Rav, Zudiver Rebbe Meir, Shamar Mishum, Rabbi Gamliel. And on that, you told us that in the name of Rav Yehuda Marav, that that only goes according to Rav Meir quoting Rav Gamliel, that we don't allow you to complete the fast when, it's, uh, when Tisha B'Av is Erev Shabbos. Aval Chachamim Omrim Misana Umashlim. But the Chachamim say, who argue with Rav Meir, that, uh, that you do complete the fast. So my lav akulu, so doesn't that imply that that statement of the Chachamim who disagree with Rav Meir is going on all the cases? when the fast day coincides with Rosh Chodesh, Hanukkah, Purim, and also when Tisha B'Av falls out on Erev Shabbos. And so what do you see? You see, therefore, that the Chachamim is Rabbi Yossi, and you, Rabbi Yosef, taught us, therefore, that the Halach is like Rabbi Yossi, and you defended it from this b'risa that you quoted us in the name of Rabbi Yehuda Marav. So lo, a <coughs> Hanukkah upurim. No, the Gemara says, not necessarily so. Because perhaps... When that Bryce says that the Chachamim disagree with Rav Meir, it's only when the fast day itself coincides <coughs> with Hanukkah, Purim, and Rosh Chodesh. In those, de- in those situations, since there's only a, um, it's, only a, it's not really a holy day in the sense of Shabbos and Yom Tov, that's where we say that the Chachamim argue with Rav Meir and they say that you should fast the whole day. But it could be very well that when Tisha B'Av coincides with Erev Shabbos, even the Chachamim would agree that we don't allow you to fast the whole day. It makes sense to conclude that. Why? Because if you're going to tell me that the Chachamim, and this is cited by Rav Yehuda Marav, hold that you do fast the whole day, even when Tisha B'Av falls out on Erev Shabbos, Well, look, we saw in yesterday's daf that Rabbah had this question. His question, the, the whole way we started the sugya was that Rabbah asked Rav Yehuda. And he asked him the question, when Tisha B'Av falls out on Erev Shabbos, do you fast the whole day or not? And Rav Yehuda didn't have an answer. So the Gemara says, if Rav Yehuda is quoted as saying that the Chachamim, he's, he's quoted as addressing this very issue from a brisa, that the Chachamim challenge Rav Meir and they say that you do fast the whole day, so why didn't Rav Yehuda have an answer? He should have said, well, you know, I, I quoted the brisa. The Gemara says, Velitai mei chadadarash marzutra mishmei derafuna alacha misanu mashlim. Well, wait a minute. We're going to see in just a second that Marzutra expounded in the name of Ravuna, also like Rav Yossi, that a person has to complete the fast when it falls out on Friday. So, Habamine Rabba me Ravuna velo pashatle. The, the, our, yesterday's daf also cited that Rabba asked Ravuna the very same question, and Ravuna didn't have an answer. So, how could Marzutra quote Ravuna as saying you fast the whole day when Ravuna w- himself, in the story, didn't have an answer to the question? So, what's going on? So, Elaha mikmei deshama, v'halabasa deshama, hachanami ha mikmei deshama, halabasa deshama. 
So the Gemara says you have to conclude that the that, that Rabbah asked the question of Ravun and Rav Yehuda earlier on, earlier in their careers, and therefore that's why they didn't have an answer because before they learned the Brisa. But once they learned the Brisa that says that the Chachamim disagree with Rav Meir and the Chachamim hold that you have to be Mashlam, you have to fast the whole day, that's why they had an answer. So it's not really a steer, it's not a contradiction, and therefore it's very possible that the Brisa is to support the Rav Yossi who says that you have to be you have to be mashlim the whole day. Yes, but there there could theoretically be a fast day on a Friday, like we have uh, Asura B'Teves, right? So the Gemara says, Hachanami Mikmi the Okay, so all of us. So Darash Marzutra Mishmei the Ravuna, and this is the statement that Marzutra, which we just said a moment ago, expounded in the name of Ravuna, Halacha Misan and Umaslim, that that's the final Halacha that you have to fast, and you have to complete the fast when the fast coincides with Erev Shabbos. And that's, and that's, that's how we pass. And that's why in Asara B'teves, which does sometimes fall out on a Friday, you have to complete the Tainas. Okay? Hadron Allah B'chol Ma'arvin. We'll come back to you, Bezrus Hashem. So now let's go on to the next parak. We're now in the, starting the fourth parak of Erevin. And here we're having, again, we're switching back to Eruvei Tchumen. Now we know that a person... When he has, uh, when he's kind of shvisa on Shabbos, he has 2,000 amis in all directions, plus he also has the city. He has the whole city, plus 2,000 amis beyond the city limits. That's what a person's normal boundaries are. Now let's talk about a case of a person who was forcibly removed from his tchum. What is he supposed to do? Well, how much leeway does he have now? Misha hotziu nachrim or ruach ra'a enlo eladalet amos. That if a person was forcibly removed from his tchum, either by uh, Gentile marauders who kidnap him and then take him in, in their wagon and then they throw him overboard and he finds himself in the middle of nowhere. So the halacha is he's not allowed to move more than Dalit Amos in any direction because he's outside of his tchum. That's what the Tanakhama says. Now what is another situation besides Gentile marauders? A ruach ra'a, an evil spirit. Rashi explains that it's a shade. A demon possesses him, and therefore he has temporary insanity because he's not in control of his facu- mental faculties anymore. And the demon takes him to a place, and he wakes up, and all of a sudden, what am I doing here? Now, we would call that, in modern psychology, we would call that a person who has, who's mentally ill. We call that a person who has a, psycho- a, a, a psychotic episode. But in the times of, the, of Chazal, they call that uh, Ruach Ra'a. He's been possessed by an evil spirit. Uh, we, I gave a shear about this uh, in my Monday Night Sugya shear a few months ago. You can reference the whole concept of demons in Jewish halacha and in Jewish literature there. But in any event, this is a real issue in halacha. So anyway, the halacha is, is that he only has Dalet Amos in every direction. <coughs> if they forcibly return him back to the city, then he's in luck because then it turns out that he never left. Since he was forcibly removed and forcibly returned, he's back to where he started. Now let's say, after they forcibly remove him from his tchum, they deposit him in another, another city, a city that has its own borders, or they put him in a barn or a corral, and this place has walls around it. So the question is, does he have only Dalet Amos from where he's standing? Or can he look at the entire city or the corral as his boundaries? So Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria, Omer Mahalich is Kula. These two Tanaim say that you have the entire area of the enclosed area where you find yourself to traverse. And Rabbi Yeshua, <coughs> Rabbi Akiva, Omrim, Enlo, Ella, Dalet Amos. Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Akiva say that you only have Dalet Amos. Can we ask everyone to put their phone on silent mode? Silent mode, please. Okay, thank you. Rabbi Shun and Rabbi Akiva say that you only have Dalet Amos, so that even though you're enclosed within your corral and your barn, you still can't move more than Dalet Amos from where, from where you find yourself. So, Maisa Shabo'u mi palandarsin v'hifligas finasam bayam. The Mishnah continues and it says that there was a story where a, 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 a group of Jews had to leave a place called Palandarsin. We don't know too much about this. At least I don't know too much about it. And it's not clear why they had to leave, but it was on a Shabbos. 
it seems like there was some force. They, they, they had to leave. They were forced to leave. Not clear what the story, what the back, background of the story is. And their boat went into the middle of the ocean, and so they were therefore outside of their tchum. So Rabbi Gamliel, the Rebbe Lazar ben Azar, Yehochu Eskula. So therefore, consistent with their shita, we just saw Rabbi Gamliel and Rebbe Lazar said that the entire ship is your domain, and you can traverse the entire ship. And Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Akiva, Lozozu midalat amos, shirotzu lahachem relatzla. They did not move outside of their Dalit Amos because consistent with their Shita and they wanted to be Machmir on themselves, they did not move Dalit Amos beyond where, the, where they were sitting on, on the ship. Another story is that once a group of Jews were traveling on a ship, they had anticipated that they would arrive to port well before Shabbos, but the ship got delayed and they did not make it back until after it was already Shabbos. And the question now is, what's my tchum? Because your tchum is defined as to where you were at the onset of Shabbos. At the onset of Shabbos, they were not yet at the port. So the question is, could they carry throughout the city? So Amrulullah Rabbi Gamliel, ma'anule raid. Are we allowed to disembark, or are we stuck on the ship for the rest of Shabbos? So Amrulahem, mutar matem, shekvar yisi mistakel, v'hayinu b'socha tchum, achalocha so Rabbi Gamliel says, no, I took note of the fact that your ship at the onset of Shabbos was already within the 2,000 Amas of the city, and therefore you were part of our Tchum when Shabbos started, and therefore you, can, you have the entire city to traverse. Now the question really is, why did Rabbi Gamliel have to give them that assurance? Because according to Rabbi Gamliel Shita, if you're forcibly, of no fault of your own, if you're forcibly moved from your Tchum into a city, you are allowed to, even if you came from outside the Tchum. So it's not clear why Rabbi Gamliel had to give him that reassurance. But by the way, you should know that this is a practical halacha. Let's say you're on a flight, and Shabbos starts while you're on your flight. So we do allow you to traverse the entire airplane, but you cannot leave the airport. You cannot leave the airport if Shabbos has already started, because the airport now becomes your limited tchum, because you, you, when Shabbos started, your tchum was somewhere way beyond the 2,000 Amma limits of the city. So now you're stuck in the airport for the rest of Shabbos. So just, just make the best of it. In the, in the Mishnah earlier, where it says that Yeshua and Rabbi Kiva didn't move from their place because they were machmer al does that mean that they necessarily toss in on everyone else the same way? Or is well, that's, well, that's the question. If you looked at the previous lines of the Mishnah, you'd notice that they paskined that for everyone you can't. Yeah, then so that's the lost? question of Machmer Lassen. It's a good question. The Gemara will probably undertake this. It's a, it's a good point. It's a very, very good deal. Tanu Rabbonah. Bryson now says, Gimel Dvarim Ma'avirin Esa Adam Al Daito Val Daskona. There are three things that remove a person from his Da'as and from the Da'as of his Creator. Now, what I think that means is, Mavirin Ha'adam Al Daito means that it causes a person to lose his Menucha Sanefesh. It causes a person to lose any sense of, of peace of mind, and plus it also causes him to disconnect from his creator and to uh, sever, sort of, have a, have a disconnected relationship with HaKadosh Baruch And what are those three things? Eluhain, Ovde Kochavim, Veruach Ra'a V'dikduke Anius. Idolatry, in other words, when he's in the company of idolaters, they can cause him to become, to lose his peace of mind, and also to get him to lose his faith. Ruach Ra'a, a demon spirit that will possess him, and abject poverty. And Lamai Naf Gamina, what, what difference does it make that I now that I know that these three things have this effect? Lami Boy Rachami Olayu. The ramification is that you have to ask Hashem for mercy that he should not subject you to these three things. And another thing that the Gemara, the Brisa says, is Gimel Ein Rowan Pene Gehunom. There are three people who suffer so much in this life. They're suffering hell on this world, and therefore they won't have to go to Gehenim in the next world. And who are those three people? Elohim, Dikduke Anius, Becholei Me'ayin Vaharishos. People who live in abject poverty, people who have intestinal disease, because that's hell on, on, that's hell on this world, right? And the third thing is, is people who are persecuted by government or people who persecute them financially, right? That's the way Rashi says, that they're constantly being hounded by, uh, by debtors, or by, by, by creditors, excuse me. So, v'yesh omrim af mishyesh lo isha ra. And some say there's a fourth one, and that is if a person has a bad wife, that's also hell on this, on this earth. 
and therefore you're saved from Gehenna. So the Gemara now says, the Idach Isha Ra Mitzvah Lagarsha. The reason why the previous opinion holds that that's not part of the list is because you can easily solve the problem, just divorce her, and then you'll be able to move on with your life. The Idach, but the other opinion says it's not so simple. Because Zimna de Ksuvasa sometimes you can't afford to divorce her because of the alimony, the Ksuva, is going to cost you an arm and a leg, and they're going to, you won't be able to live. And Inami Isle Bana Mina Velomatsi Megareshla. Or it could also be that you have children from her, and therefore you can't bring yourself to divorce her because who's going to raise your, your kids for you? You want it for the sake of the kids, you'll stay in the marriage. Right? So therefore, therefore it is appropriate to include that as hell on this earth that you can't get out of, and therefore you're saved from Ganem. So the Lord asks again, Lamai naf gamina, what, what import is it to know that these three or four things save you from Ganem? That answer is, L'kubule <laughs> me'ahava, to accept it out of love, which means that a person should realize <clears throat> that even though my life is miserable and wretched, nevertheless, I accept it as Hashem's gift to me because at least suffering in this world will save me from suffering in the next world. So, I go home every day, right? So if a guy <laughs> has experience, he goes home every day, and he's got a nagging uh, wife who just makes his life miserable, he should have simcha. He should be, accept it with joy. Ah, oh, Baruch Hashem, I have a shrew as a wife. I, the fire of Gehenna will be much cooler for me. You know, right? It's interesting that in the Yiddish language, among the women, the pushatur, they used to say, Everton is not from gaining Gehenna. They're watching them again and do it. What does it mean? What does it mean? He won't have to go to the Gehenna because he has the Gehenna already. Oh. <laughs> there so you go. This is part of the normal... The parlance, yeah. No, I was always listening. Yeah. Now you know the source. Now you know, now you know the source. Yeah. Now you know There's the so source. so many things when I learned this, the way the Yiddish language. Absolutely. Thing. It's very much a part of the whole culture. Okay. Shlosha Mason Keshehem Misaprin Veiluin. And then the third thing of three th uh, three things that list the listeners' yeah. prices, yeah. there are three people who die in mid-sentence, which means that even though they may appear perfectly healthy, they could drop dead at any moment. And they are Choli Meayin, a person who has intestinal disease, Vechaya, a person, a woman who's in labor, and Vahadrokan. Hadrokan is a type of mouth disease, Rashi says. I'm not <coughs> sure with what kind of mouth disease, mouth disease it is. Uh, if anyone has a translation, let me know. It says dropsy. Dropsy. Whatever that okay. is. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Nafkamina, of what import is this? The Mishmushe Buhu Zavdasa. But if you know that a person has this kind of condition, you should have Tachrichin available. Uh, <coughs> just, just in case something happens. Amar of Nachman, Amar Shmuel, Yavsal Adas, Eno Ela Arba Amas. So, Rav Nachman says the name of Shmuel, let me tell you, important halacha that if he's forcibly removed from his tchum, but then he voluntarily walks <coughs> back to his tchum, he's penalized in that he doesn't, he only has Dalet Amos. So the Gemara says, Pshita, that should be easily inferred from the Mishnah. What do I need Shmuel to teach me this? I'm sorry. Yatsaladas means that he voluntarily walks out of his tchum. If you already told me in the Mishnah that if he's forcibly removed, he only has Dalet Amos, then surely if he voluntarily walks out, the maze that he only has Dalet Amos. So the Gemara says, Ela ema chaza ladas ema Dalet Amos. But rather what he means is, says Shmuel, that if he was forcibly removed and then walked back voluntarily, he only has Dalet Amos. I jumped the gun when I first <laughs> spoke the Gemara. So the Gemara says, But hanami tanino. But that also should be uh, clear, uh, clearly inferable from the Mishnah because it says, Hetziru nachrim ki ilu but that also should be clear from the Mishnah because the Mishnah says the only time that a person goes back to his, to his regular status is only if he was forcibly removed and forcibly returned. So the Mashmao says that if he was forcibly removed and voluntarily walked back of his own volition, then he also only has Dalet Amos. So what do you need Shmuel to tell me that if it's clear from the Mishnah? So Ella Ema Yatsaladas the Hsiru Nachrim Eno Ella Daladamas. So rather Shmuel is telling me that if a person of his own volition leaves the Tchum, and then he's forcibly returned by Gentiles, so there too he only has Daladamas. But the Gemara says, But wait a minute, Hanami Tanina. 
הוציאו והחזירו כאילו לא יצא. הוציאו והחזירו זה כאילו לא יצא, אבל יצא לדעת לא. The Gemara says, look, it says in the Mishnah that the only time that a person returns to his original status is only if he's forcibly removed and forcibly returned. So in a case where he voluntarily removed himself, and then he was forcibly returned, that also should be quite clear from the Mishnah that you don't go back to your original status, because you haven't fulfilled both criteria of being forcibly removed and forcibly returned. So the Gemara says, no, that's not so clear from the Mishnah. I'll tell you why. Because you could have learned the Mishnah in the following way. That the Mishnah is making two independent statements. So if Gentiles forcibly remove him, so then it makes no difference whether they forcibly return him or whether he voluntarily returns. Right? Right? But in both situations, the Mishnah says any time he's forcibly removed by Gentiles, it doesn't matter what happens. If, whether he stays there or whether he returns of his own volition, he only has Dalet Amos. And then the second statement of the Mishnah is, what happens if he's forcibly returned to a city? And that's completely disparate from the first statement of Hotzi Uhu. Whereas when he was forcibly removed, so then... If, if, if the forcible removal from the Tchum makes no difference because regardless of whether he stays there or whether he comes back, he only has Dalet Amos. But if he was forcibly returned, so then it could be, then, then it makes no difference whether he voluntarily walked out of the city or whether he was forcibly removed from the city. Since he was forcibly returned, he's Ke'ilu Lo Yatsa. It, may, it would, be, would be considered as if he never left. We give him his original status. That could be a way of interpreting the Mishnah. And therefore, you needed Kamash Malan, you needed Shmuel to teach you that you need to fulfill both criteria. You need to be forcibly removed and forcibly returned in order to go back to your original status. So, Ba Amine Me Rabba. Now they ask Rabba the following question. I'm running out of time, Mr. Grudis. I have to go weiter. I'm sorry. Ba Amine Me Rabba. They ask Rabba the following question. Hutzrach Lenekava of Mahu. What if a person has to go to the washroom? He has to go to the bathroom. And he's stuck here because he's outside his tchum and all he has is Dalet Amos. What's a guy to do if he has to defecate? Amr lahem, gadol kavad abriya shadoches losasa shabatayra. So this is a famous quote, that kavod abriyos, that human dignity supersedes even a mitzvah of the Torah, even a mitzvah losasa from the Torah. Rashi tells us, as he does in other places in Shas, that the losasa shabatayra that we're referring to is not, is not biblical law, but rather, rabbinic law, which is rooted in the mitzvahs lo sasei of lo sasur min adover, min adover shiagidu l'chay that you may not digress from what the sages tell you right or left. That's, <coughs> that's the way Rashi and the other Rishonim learn the Gemara, that it means that kavod abrios overrides rabbinic law. It doesn't mean that it overrides biblical law. Because like we remember we learned when it comes to shatnas, if a person is wearing shatnas in the shuk, then we rip it off of him, even if it means he's going to walk around uh, in, a, in, in an undignified manner. There we don't worry about kavod abrius. Okay? So, anyway, this is a long discussion. So, Amri Nahar Da'i, Ipi Ke'ahu, Ayla Tuchuma, V'kivin Da'ol Ol. So the rabbis of Nahar Da'a said, if a guy's outside the tchum and he has to go to the bathroom, if he's a sharpshooter, if he's a sharp cookie, then here's what he should do. He should find a bathroom that's inside his original tchum. And therefore, once he's, once he's got a heter to go back to his original tchum to go to the bathroom, then he can stay for the rest of Shabbos because now he's back. It's as if like he was forcibly returned by, by Gentiles because Kavad Abrius is like being, I'm forced to, I have no choice, I have to go to the washroom. So, Amar of Papa, Peiroshi Yatsuchutz L'Tchum V'Chazru, Afilu B'Meizad Lo Hitzidu Es Mekoma. So now we've learned previously that even inanimate objects are konish visa. Even inanimate objects <coughs> are limited to their 2,000 amas in all directions, such as produce. What if someone, force, what if someone removes produce from its tchum? So, <coughs> so the halacha is, even if they were removed intentionally, willfully, and returned willfully by a Jew, nevertheless, they don't, re they don't lose their, their 2,000 amas. My taima. Ons and Ninhu. 
because the produce itself is an onus, is, is not, did, did not move of its own volition. If you ask that tomato, why did you leave the tchum, he's not going to tell you because I decided I wanted to leave. That Jew took me out. But the tomato has no sentience, has no volition. And therefore, it's considered to be an onus, and is no different from a Jew who was forcibly removed from his tchum and forcibly returned. So too the tomato is forcibly removed and forcibly returned, and therefore returns back to its original status as far as tchum. And therefore, what's the ramification? If today is Yantif, and I, want, and I see that tomato over there that was forcibly removed and forcibly returned, I can take that tomato back to my house, and I don't have to eat it mamish at that spot, <coughs> because it's not limited by the Dalet Amos that it would normally be. So, Eisve Rav Yosef Bar Shemayel Rav Papa. So, let me show you the following b'risa that challenges that. Rabbi Nechemiah and Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov Omrim, La Olam Asurin Atshe Yechazu L'Makom and Shogigin, B'Shogigin B'Mezid Lo. That there's a b'risa that says that according to these, these two Tanoim, you're not allowed to uh, move the produce unless it's, re- unless it's re- restored back to its original spot, Bishogeg, unintentionally. No. But if it was intentionally removed, re- returned to this spot, Bemezid, sinfully, willfully, so then uh, it's limited to Dalet Amos. Not like you just said, that uh, you look at the tomato's volition, you don't look at the person's volition. So the Gemara says, the answer is Tanoi, and it's a Machlokas Tanoi. And actually, we'll just quote the Brisa today, even though we won't understand it, and then we'll unpack it tomorrow. So the Tanya, what's the Machlokas, what's the Brisa? Peros sheyatsu chutz latchum, if produce leaves the tchum, b'shoge ye achlu, b'mezid lo ye achlu. Then, um, if the produce is found outside the tchum now, so then if it was forcibly removed, b'shoge, so then the produce can be eaten by someone who finds himself in the spot where the produce is right now. But if it's done b'mezid, it cannot be eaten. Okay? And Rabbi Nechemya Omer, b'makomon ye achlu, shalom b'makomon lo ye achlu. And Rabbi Nechemya says, if they came back to their original spot, they can be eaten. But, as long as they are outside the tchum, they're not allowed to be eaten no matter what. Now we're going to define that, we'll explain that rice, Amir Sashem, tomorrow. Have a wonderful day.